Welcome everyone to the Wednesday, October 4th, 2023 formal meeting of the Iowa City Planning and Zoning Commission. For the roll call, please note that Wade, Townsend, Elliott, Hench, Craig, Quellhorst, and Padron are all present. The next item up on the agenda is public discussion of any item not on the agenda. So if there's any member of the public who's present who'd like to address the commission on an item that's not on tonight's agenda, now's your opportunity. Second call, seeing no one come up, we'll move on. So under zoning code amendment items, item number four, case number REZ23-0001. This is a continuation of discussion of the accessory apartments from August 8th, 2nd, sorry. And it is consideration of an amendment to Title 14, zoning to improve housing choice, increase housing supplies, and encourage affordability. Kirk. Yes, thank you, Chair. Kirk Lehman, Associate Planner, to talk about uh, the proposed changes to accessory apartment standards. That would be a continuation of the August 2nd meeting. Uh, in terms of some general background, this is part of a package of proposed amendments uh, with a goal of increasing flexibility for a range of housing types, modifying design standards, providing additional flexibility to enhance the supply of housing, creating regulatory incentives for affordable housing, then also addressing fair housing. So that package came back before you on August 2nd. Uh, the commission did recommend approval of those items with the exception of those changes related to accessory apartments. Um, at that time, staff was directed to solicit more public feedback regarding those changes. Um, and we are back with you after that. So in terms of the public feedback uh, that we solicited, we held two open houses for an opportunity for the community to learn more about the proposed changes, ask questions and talk with staff about the changes, and then also provide feedback uh, in a survey to indicate uh, what concerns there were. The open houses were held on September 13th from 5 to 7 and from September 14th from 5 to 7 uh, at two different locations in different parts of town. Uh, we did have 58 folks that signed in as well as some others who attended but did not sign in. We also uh, received 51 surveys, both through a combination of folks that were in the public meetings and then also online as well. Uh, of those survey responses, we did get a majority of respondents that were concerned about allowing accessory apartments on rental properties. That's one of the proposed changes, as I'll discuss in a minute. Um, the other changes were not, uh, a majority of the respondents were not concerned with those changes according to the survey. Um, but the second most proposed change that provoked concern was requiring a parking space or not requiring a parking space for accessory apartments. That was at 45% concern versus a 53% uh, who were not concerned. <clears throat> so with regards to the proposed amendments, like I said, this is part of that package. It's part of the, the section on providing additional flexibility to enhance the supply of housing, uh, specifically as they relate to modifying the standards for accessory apartments. Uh, in terms of the proposed changes, there are quite a few of them, so I'll just kind of detail those uh, as a refresher for you all. Um, so some of the changes are allowing accessory uses to be uh, in places that they're currently not allowed, so allowing them to be accessory to single family or duplex uses in addition to, or instead of only having it be allowed with detached single family uses, uh, allowing them in any zone that allows residential uses instead of, instead of specified zones. Uh, there are also other requirements uh, that, that staff is proposing to change. So that is that the owner not be required to live on the site, which they currently are. Uh, that was the item that was flagged as the most concern for folks. Uh, no longer requiring an off-street parking space for accessory apartments. Currently, that is a standard where one space must be provided. Um, no longer having an additional restriction on bedrooms and occupants other than what would be required from a rental permit for single family and duplex uses. In this case, that means that no more than 35% of the floor area could be bedrooms. Uh, changing the size limitations somewhat, um, such that it be the lesser of 1,000 square feet or 50% of the floor area of the main building. Um, that's a change from a smaller uh, amount that uh, was previously required, in addition to the fact that for a detached accessory apartment, it ha could only be a portion of a detached accessory structure. So in effect, that meant that you couldn't have a standalone accessory apartment. With these changes to the way that sizes would be regulated, it'd be based off the principal use. And so you could have a standalone uh, accessory dwelling unit. You could also have an attached accessory dwelling unit that would be added in an addition to a building. 
So that's another change. Um, and then finally, uh, with regards to the design standards, uh, there currently is a standard that uh, accessory apartments have to be entered from uh, the side or rear lot line, and this would say that uh, no entrance locations are dictated in the way that, that that's designed. Um, I did also want to mention that staff is continuing to recommend the owner occupancy requirement, primarily because our understanding of council's goals with this proposed amendment are tied to increasing housing supply and housing diversity of housing types. So, so we are keeping that uh, in our recommendation as I'll talk about later. Uh, in terms of an analysis uh, of what the proposed changes uh, might cause, um, currently the existing situation is that we really haven't seen much ADU development uh, in the last 30 years. We've seen about 52 units out of approximately 10,000 eligible properties. Um, Part of the reason for that is that our current standards appear to be a barrier to construction to accessory dwelling units. Uh, so as a result, in our 2022 Affordable Housing Action Plan, it recommended promoting ADUs more, allowing them in more cases, more situations. Uh, it also recommended looking at the owner occupancy requirement as well. Uh, and this does uh, come to a special head now as more and more households are single person households where smaller units uh, are something uh, that are uh, required essentially. In terms of those impacts then, uh, the, the parcels that are currently eligible will remain eligible. Uh, I put that at 13,000 because that would include any properties that currently have a rental permit that are single family um, since uh, that can change at any time whether it's rental or owner occupied. Uh, in addition, it would expand the number of parcels to which ADUs would be allowed. So up to 1,400 new units would be allowed by expanding the zones and uses to which they're accessory. Um, an additional 3,100 new units could potentially accommodate ADUs uh, by removing the owner occupancy requirement as well. Uh, in addition, we would expect more property owners to take advantage of accessory dwelling units uh, by trying to remove some of those other barriers that we heard about, so things like the parking requirement, trying to increase size, trying to allow as a standalone use, uh, different things that we've heard about uh, that act as barriers. Uh, in addition, we do see trying to encourage accessory dwelling units as being especially compatible with our sustainability goals, uh, since these would be added with existing buildings for the most part, and those would tend to be in more walkable areas of the city. So we see it as pairing nicely with some of our standards, such as trying to encourage alternative modes of transportation and our uh, free two-year transit trial that we are currently uh, have in effect. So in terms of the parcels uh, that would potentially be affected, the green areas on this map are those that would currently allow an ADU uh, if they are owner occupied. Um, the proposed amendments would continue to allow these if they're owner occupied, but it would also mean that they could have an ADU if they're renter occupied as well. The yellow areas are new areas that would allow ADUs that currently do not. In some cases, uh, these are zones that previously hadn't allowed them, uh, in other cases, there are areas where you'll see more duplexes or other uses that currently don't allow an ADU. Staff did also look at other comparable communities. Um, the materials in the poster were provided in your packet and uh, we gave you some examples of different communities that are both in Iowa and that are other college towns and what they're doing. Uh, what we've seen is that many communities have recently reevaluated their ADU regulations. That includes removing things like owner occupancy requirements, off street parking requirements, increasing allowable sizes, modifying what uh, ADUs can be accessory to. Uh, part of the reason for this is that, you know, all of America is experiencing the housing crisis that we are currently experiencing. And accessory dwelling units are a way that you can really integrate new density uh, while still maintaining the character of those neighborhoods as well. Uh, that being said, each community does have a unique set of regulations, um, so they are all a little different. Some require owner occupancy, some don't. Some require parking, some don't. Some have more strict design requirements. Uh, it, it all really depends on the community. Uh, but that being said, our proposed changes are in line with other communities that are in similar situations. We also looked at best practices when uh, looking at our accessory dwelling units. Um, the American Planning Association produces an equity and zoning policy guide that we use. So within that policy guide, it really recommends allowing a broader range of building forms, lot sizes and lot widths, uh, and residential types 
specifically in low-density residential neighborhoods. It also recommends allowing ADUs without a public hearing and only using conditions that are needed to mitigate potential impacts on neighboring, or neighboring properties within that community. Uh, but all of these are based on national best practices. They really review what works and what doesn't work in different communities and how can we further equity through our zoning code. We also relied uh, on the uh, American Association of Retired Persons, which ha produces lots of content uh, about accessory dwelling units. Uh, and in fact, uh, the proposed changes that we brought before you were really the, the product of recommendations made by the Johnson County Livable Communities uh, Housing Action Group. Um, so that's a group that includes uh, lots of folks. Uh, it's staffed by a person from the county and the goal is to try and make sure that uh, communities are livable for folks as you age within that community. And so accessory dwelling units are really seen uh, as a key component of allowing people to age in place. Uh, in terms of, uh, of best practices that they recommend is things like allowing these uses in all zones that allow single family residential uses. Again, only requiring those conditions needed to mitigate potential impacts. Uh, treating like other uses in the zone, and that is uh, not treating them, uh, treat, treating them like they're, they're a valid use within the zone rather than some sort of a use that is an undesirable use within the zone. Um, but treating it like other uses is things like looking at owner occupancy requirements, and if that's not regulated in the zoning code, then they would recommend not regulating that for accessory dwelling units. Uh, it also talks about things like parking requirements can make accessory dwelling units challenging, uh, and limiting design requirements that can increase the cost of constructing ADUs. In addition, uh, the push towards encouraging accessory units is consistent with our comprehensive plan. Uh, within our vision statement, we talk about creating attractive and affordable housing for all people, housing that is the foundation of a healthy, safe, and diverse neighborhoods throughout our city. Uh, again, those relevant strategies and goals are things like mixing housing types throughout neighborhoods, uh, to provide household, uh, household options for all types of households, whether they be singles, families, retirees, et cetera, and ensuring a balance of housing types, promoting small <coughs> lot and infill development, and then especially supporting that uh, infill development in areas where services and infrastructure are already in place. It also does support other policy documents that the city has adopted over the past several years. It includes our uh, affordable housing action plans, which we first adopted in 2016 and then adopted an update to in uh, 2022. Like I said, uh, that does talk about increasing the, the allowable number and type of dwelling units in single family zoning districts by right. They specifically call out ADUs and they also specifically call out considering ADUs associated with rental housing as something to consider. Uh, in addition to things like the 2019 fair housing study that really talks about exploring ways to increase density and explore the types of housing that are allowed, especially in those low density single family zones. In terms of public correspondence, staff's received uh, several pieces of correspondence um, that's been forwarded to you or included in your packet. You'll also find it at your spots. Uh, and I believe that this does miss our latest piece of correspondence that was submitted uh, very recently. Um, but that's all been provided to you uh, for your consideration as well. In terms of staff recommendations, staff does recommend uh, that Title 14 be amended as illustrated in Attachment 4 of our staff report. Uh, so it, it, it's the, similar to what was proposed before. There are a few small changes, but uh, nothing substantive. Um, but with the goal of, again, improving housing choice, increasing housing supply, uh, and encouraging housing affordability. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, upon a recommendation by the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, we would expect it to be scheduled for consideration by council. Uh, oh, yes. There is one more part of our recommendation that we are recommending that I did not include in this presentation, which is we currently call accessory dwelling units accessory apartments. That has been a confusing term for many. Um, and we've gotten lots of calls uh, ab about what exactly is meant by an accessory apartment. So we would also propose uh, changing uh, just our terminology to ADUs. 
That's also consistent with our rental code, which calls them ADUs. So uh, anywhere that it says accessory apartment, we would change it out for ADU. Would you need a separate motion for that? Or if we uh, <coughs> put on the motion tonight, you just want that included in the motion? I would say include that in the motion. Okay. So we intend on updating that as we bring it before council. So the ordinance that goes before council would reflect that, uh, assuming that that is part of Planning and Zoning Commission's motion. But we would recommend that that be changed. Um, sorry about that. So in, in terms of the timeline then passed uh, a recommendation by P and Z, assuming that recommendation is arrived at tonight, uh, the earliest it would go to council is November 6th. That would be the public hearing. Uh, and then there would be two additional readings by council uh, at the second meeting in November and then the first meeting in December, which would be December 12th. So December 12th would be the earliest uh, that something would be considered for adoption by council. Uh, and with that, do you have any questions for me uh, off the bat? Okay. Now is a portion of the meeting where if any of the commissioners have questions for staff for that interchange to happen. And just for the, the public knows, um, we've talked about this previously on August 2nd. So this is our second look at this. So any questions for staff? Yeah, I have a question. Um, thank you very much for the thorough and thoughtful presentation. Uh, I especially appreciated the comparison to uh, regulations in comparable communities. And you mentioned that some of those communities have recently uh, eliminated the owner occupancy requirement. And I was just wondering if we know anything about the experience of those communities and whether it was positive or negative or, you know, kind of a mixed bag. So I would say these changes are pretty fresh in a lot of communities. Uh, I know that when, when I talk about best practices that have led to, um, that have been incorporated in a lot of these documents, those are based on communities that made similar changes and found that that increased their uh, development of accessory dwelling units within that community. Um, within the specific comparable communities that I provided, I'm not sure if we have outcome data from that yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and would you happen to know if anybody has recently gone the other way that's similarly situated to Iowa City? Uh, you know, that would be adopting an owner occupancy requirement when they didn't previously have one. I'm I think, I think just, just, just to clarify, our regulations currently require that the owner live on site. And what we're proposing is that owner occupancy requirement be removed so the owner would no longer need to live on site, so both units could be rented. Right. I, I, I'm just wondering if, if there's been a community that's been in an in inverse situation where they did not have Wait, an owner occupancy requirement. They went from rental to owner. A, and then they adopted one, right? I'm not aware of any. Um, most of them have been similar changes to the sorts of changes that we're promoting or okay. that we're recommending. Thank you. I have a question. With there now being two units on the property, if the owner decides to sell, are those sold separately? And if so, how do they decide what goes with, with who, what the lot line should be? Sure, so there's a standard in our code currently that requires that both units on the lot be under common ownership. So you can't sell an accessory apartment and not sell the principal use. Uh, they have to be under the same ownership. So. Uh, we're not proposing to change that standard. That would continue to be in effect. So the owner doesn't have to live on the property, but whoever buys the new property has to buy both units. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's correct. Unless the lot was split or there'd be a subdivision, I mean, that would be a different process. You know, then you're in the realm of the subdivision regulations, platting regulations. But as long as the units are on the same lot, then it's considered an accessory dwelling unit. You know, if you divide it up, then you've got two principal uses. You know, but that again takes platting changes. Okay. That makes sense. You but to be clear, if there was a subdivision, it would have to follow all regulations within our code, which includes street frontage. So you couldn't have a situation where, you know, you've got a unit in the front and a unit on an alley where they split it down the middle that's not something that would be allowed under the subdivision code. Presumably, I suppose you could have a corner lot where both units meet minimum lot size requirements and everything. Presumably, that could be split, but. If there was a subdivision, it wouldn't be an ADU anymore, so then. Yeah, it, it would become a principal use. 
if it could meet all the standards for the principal use, exactly. So how would these units help large families? I mean, these are all smaller units that we're talking about now, so it's really not going to help the affordable housing problem we have with families of four or five. So, so large families, the way that accessory dwelling units are often used is, I, I would call it extended families, where, you know, like the parents would live in the in-law suite, you might have the kids live in the main unit or vice versa if you have young kids. Um, but the, I mean, that's how it would be used to support larger families. So I guess I would not call that affordable housing. I'm, I would call that convenience for someone with means. <laughs> Is that, you, you see, if I have enough to build a separate unit for my in-laws, then I must have, I must not be in that affordable housing um, realm. Is that? I mean, it, in, in the sense that an accessory dwelling unit is up to 1,000 square feet, which is a relatively small unit that could be built under IRC code standards, which is more affordable than building under multifamily standards, for example, it, it's a more affordable housing product. Affordable housing for a single person or a, a two, for two people, but not for a family, because it's not big enough for a family or a family. I, I guess what Kirk is trying to say is that um, with, if you have a multi-generational household where you have um, grandparents, parents, children, it can provide additional room for those families. If you're taking care of a family member who has a disability or who has an illness, they could be nearby and be on site. Um, and I think in, in terms of the affordability uh, concern, there's a couple ways that we're thinking about affordability with these amendments and with the amendments to accessory dwelling units, we're think, really thinking about it in terms of supply and ways to increase the housing supply in our community. Right now, su the supply is not keeping up with the demand and it's impacting price. Um, it's also a way to encourage different types of housing. Um, as Kirk mentioned, accessory dwelling units are smaller, they're gonna cost less, um, the price point is going to be lower than your typical detached single-family home. And one of the proposed changes is actually to remove the occupant limit, right? So right now you can only have two people in an ADU, and conceivably under these regulations, if you know the other like size requirements were met, you could have like three people or you know potentially a small family. Is that right? That is correct. On, on that question that Scott brought up, or to that point. Um, in the packet, it says that the occupancy would be determined by the rental permit. Could you just discuss that briefly? Yeah, so in single family and duplex uses to which uh, accessory dwelling units could be accessory to uh, under the proposed amendments, um, there's a requirement that no more than 35% of a unit may be bedrooms, which acts as a de facto occupancy limit. There's also additional occupancy limits based on the square footage of the unit. Um, so presumably you could have a three bedroom accessory dwelling unit under the proposed standards with that 35% standard uh, accounting for minimum bedroom sizes that are allowed. Um, but that, that's really what that means. Instead of having a separate, you know, these are the caps that we, that we use, we use the standards that are within our rental code. Any additional questions for staff on this item? I got two items. Um, so Fayetteville and Cedar Rapids, it looks like they allow two ADUs per lot. Um, and is our recommendation just a single, is that correct? Yeah, so we are recommending a single with a duplex. In some cases, you'll see it where it's single family where they allow two accessory dwelling units. Uh, in the case of states that have preempted uh, local jurisdictions ability to regulate ADUs, you see situations where it's a duplex and two ADUs. Um, so there, there's a variety of different ways that people allow them. We are recommending one ADU per lot. And uh, I did read in the packet regarding uh, the owner restriction. Um, from administration, like I can understand from the building permit how we uh, administer that, but 
uh, with the change of ownership of the property and such, uh, how's the, what's the long-term administration look like on having that restriction? Yeah, so it can be challenging. Um, in some cases, a, a family might purchase, a, a, let's just say a house that has an ADU with it. Um, they use the ADU for storage, they don't rent it out. You know, it's not something that, that we really check. Um, but we do check in to make sure that it doesn't become occupied at some point because once it's occupied, then it needs a rental permit. Uh, there are challenges where houses are sold and then the main house is rented out and there's still an ADU on the property. Um, that can be an administrative challenge. I don't know uh, the exact answer about how we deal with it, but I, I presume that it just doesn't count towards the occupancy of the rental permit. It, it's dead space, so to speak, storage space, so to speak. But it just, for administrative, it's just kind of like a discovery if it's misused, I guess, after the ADU is already up. Is that right? M more or less, just like any yeah. standard in our code. Okay. Any other questions? No, that's it. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Now we're going to go to the public hearing um, portion <coughs> of the meeting. Um, just to review a couple of the rules, every speaker will have five minutes. When you come up, please state your name and sign in. I'll start the timer once you state your name. Um, since this is our second time around for it, I'm going to enforce the time pretty strictly. Last time I was pretty liberal. If you are speaking on behalf of a group and that group has, a, has named you as the speaker, then you can have eight minutes. Please let me know if that's when you, that is the case. But that means other people in your group aren't speaking. You're doing it for them. And then once we've gone through it completely, then we'll do two minutes per speaker. And then the same rules um, about that. Please just get up and remind us who you are. And that's a lot to help out the um, minute taker. So we'll open the public hearing and go ahead and. Good evening. Sign in, Jim, if there's a sheet there. Yeah, and are you gonna be, help, be able to help yep. me with the photos? I, I'm ready, just tell me which one to put up when. Uh, the. Um the one of the block first. And I will. There we go. Good evening. My name is Jim Throgmorton. I speak to you as co-chair of the Northside Neighborhood Association Steering Committee. I come before you tonight to ask that you amend item 3C2 in the staff's August 2 memo for properties located within the university impact area we urge you to continue requiring ADUs to be built only on owner-occupied properties. We further recommend that you carve out an exception to permit nonprofit providers of income-restricted housing to build ADUs on properties within the uh, UIA, University Impact Area. Two months ago, you deferred action on the ADU provisions. Thank you for doing that. And the city staff, as Kirk said, conducted two open houses pertaining to the ADUs. Several Northside neighborhood uh, neighbors attended and some had stimulating conversations with individual staff members. But these conversations did not enable shared learning on the part of all attendees. Many attendees looked puzzled as they were studying the posters. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, they appeared to be wondering, what do the ADU amendments mean for my neighborhood? The first challenge residents face when trying to answer that question is to understand the staff's reports. This is no easy task, partly because the technical language of zoning is unfamiliar to most people. Adding to the difficulty is that the proposed changes vary by zoning category. My own neighborhood contains at least 12 different types of zones, plus three historical overlay districts and one overlay conservation district. The second challenge is to determine how the changes might affect neighborhoods on the ground. This is a daunting task that exceeds the capabilities of normal people trying to live their lives. It calls for collaboration and dialogue between neighborhood leaders and the city planning staff. So to help Northsiders understand how the amendments might affect our neighborhood, we focused our attention on the medium density residential, that is RS8, 
areas that lie outside the historic preservation districts. Zooming in, we studied one block in Goosetown. It's the long block on the bottom left of this. This tree-lined block currently contains 31 properties, one of which is vacant. All but one of the main buildings were built in the first half of the last century. They are all one to two stories in height. The assessed value of this block, of this block's 30 single family properties, averages a modest $216,000. Being in the UIA, the entire block is affected by the demand for off-campus student housing. Nine of the 31 properties are owned by incorporated entities, and 14 of the 31 properties are rentals. The amendments pertaining to the ADUs could, when combined with the amendments per permitting duplexes and attached single-family structures, cause some speculative investors to think of Goose Town and other neighborhoods in the UIA as major opportunities for financial gain. In this scenario, market competition would drive the cost of land up. When properties go on sale, investors would outbid potential owner occupants. They would very likely demolish older, lower cost owner occupied structures and replace them with the largest possible rental duplexes or attached single family structures coupled with rentable ADUs. All of this would make it extremely difficult for anyone to buy starter homes in these neighborhoods. Kirk tells me that seven of the lots on this block, this block could potentially be redeveloped with duplexes and that 24 of the lots could potentially have ADUs. So we looked more closely at the, if you could, thank you. We looked more closely at two lots in the southwestern corner of the block. One is currently vacant, whereas the other is occupied by a one and a half story single family structure. Picture an investor building a new structure and ADU on the vacant lot while that investor, or perhaps another one, purchases the existing structure on the adjacent lot and builds a new ADU in the back. Picture all of the structures being rentals. Picture this being replicated throughout Goose Town and other neighborhoods in the UIA. The ADU amendments might increase the supply of housing in this and similar neighborhoods but the supply of affordable owner-occupied housing would shrink. And while diversifying housing choices, this amendment could result in the neighborhoods becoming more dominated by investor-owned rental structures. Retain the owner-occupied requirement for properties in the UIA. Carve out an exception for nonprofits. Thank you for paying attention. And thank you for your help, Dr. Kirk, too. So we're next. And I have copies for the commission members and one for the staff. Thanks. Thank you. My name is William Gorman, and I'm chair of the housing action team of the Johnson County Livable Community for Successful Aging Policy Board. Last November, we held a forum on ADUs and invited all 11 cities in Johnson County to attend. We invited the city councils and the mayors, as well as home builders and realtors. We focused on the benefits of ADUs to help seniors age in place, as well as the need for affordable housing for people of all ages. One month later, in December, we submitted to all 11 cities in Johnson County what I would describe as a white paper, providing recommendations on the elements of a potential ADU zoning code. To be clear, we reached out to Iowa City and the other cities in Johnson County. They did not reach out to us. And, but we do appreciate the fact that the City of Iowa City staff took our recommendations seriously. At your direction from the previous meeting, the staff did reach out to the community to solicit additional input, including looking at how other university towns have addressed ADUs. 
The results show that university towns have utilized a variety of strategies. Some university towns do not require owner occupancy, some do. We continue to support the staff recommendations with one caveat. Clearly, many residents have expressed genuine concerns regarding the proposed removal of the owner occupancy requirement. Even though we believe removing the owner occupancy, occupancy requirement is best practice, and removing the owner occupancy requirements, a requirement is likely to more significantly increase the number of ADUs that could be developed, it is very difficult to forecast how many developers will feel there is sufficient profit margin to purchase homes and then add on an ADU in order to rent out both dwellings. Kirk Lehman's October 4th letter to you on page 7 notes the following, ADA, ADUs may support the stability of existing neighborhoods by accommodating extended families or creating an opportunity to generate revenue from the tenants, but it may be necessary to limit them to properties where the primary dwelling unit is the owner's primary residence to avoid speculative investment, particularly when used as short-term rentals. And then on top of that, since Iowa law does not allow cities to prohibit short-term rentals, in the abundance of caution, we now recommend that Iowa City keep the owner occupancy requirement, indicating that the lot owner must reside in the primary residence or the ADU. Then we suggest that the city revisit this issue in two to four years to see if the requirement can be dropped. So in other words, give it some time, monitor it, and then see if you can remove that requirement later. Lastly, we encourage the city to review its permitting process to look for ways to simplify the application process, decrease fees, and eliminate any regulations that may hinder ADU development. Thank you. Thank you, William. Whoever is next. Hi, gang. Um, I miss you guys. And your name, ma'am, is? <laughs> ah, and I have to write first. <laughs> I'm Phoebe Martin. Um, so I am speaking to you personally, not, uh, not for all realtors. But um, two things I want to say. Thank you guys for bringing this whole thing up. I'm very excited. But also, Billy, you asked a great question, and I kind I kind of want to respond to that. So obviously I work with a lot of different types of clients um, and I have a few different people that have been keeping an eye on all of this. One of which is a family that has a son that cannot afford to buy their own house on their own lot. They could potentially afford to build an ADU in their backyard, um, but it does not have an alley. It would need to, it'd be weird to be on the side. It'd, make more sense, sort of like a little compound. And it's also significantly cheaper than them bringing in external care to them renting something else. Um, so even though that seems um, kind of uh, frivolous, it actually would actually, it would really help them in terms of affordability. Um, also, I have a lot of clients that are looking to rent tiny houses which is something that Iowa City has not always been a huge fan of. So every tiny house I've sold, and oddly enough, I've sold quite a few of them, they go immediately, and you know, it, I think more of that would be even better because then we're also reducing our carbon footprint a little bit there. Um, and people that don't want yards. Um, and seeing lots of clients that are looking for studio, office, and homeschooling space. Um, you know, the idea of owner occupied or not, I think it would be just fine to not have that requirement. Um, but I also see a lot of people, uh, one of which is on Davenport Street, who bought their house thinking that was going to be their forever investment and would love to have an ADU on there so that they could rent out both, and that's their retirement fund. Um, but they don't want to live there anymore. So anyway, that's what I have to say. Thanks, kids. 
It's Thanks, nice Steve. to see everyone. Is ever next? Hello, my name is Deanna Thoman and I live at 208 Fairchild Street. That's in the north side. Um, tonight, I am just here to read a letter. Um, I believe you actually received it. I was thinking you didn't. It's from Anne Freerks. Okay, um, and I think it's important to consider her words within the context of this meeting. She couldn't make it tonight. She wanted to talk with you, so I am doing that for her. And it's Anne's birthday today, so happy birthday, Anne. That is why she can't be here. <laughs> yes, it's her birthday. She's celebrating that. So she says, Dear Planning and Zoning Commissioners, I am writing to urge, to urge you to vote against the proposal that would allow rental properties to have accessory, accessory dwelling units in all residential zones, including the RNS 12 zone. I have lived in a near downtown Iowa City neighborhood for over 30 years. During this time, I have worked to create stable housing for all I am not a NIMBY. There is a 12-plex in my backyard, duplexes, triplexes, and lots of multifamily um, houses in my neighborhood. But there are also single-family homes that are key to the balance and fabric of the community. These are some of the most fragile portions of our neighborhoods and this proposal would threaten that balance. I spent over 15 years on the Planning and Zoning Commission here in Iowa City, many of those as chair. I did this to create positive change and a healthy community. I have worked through comprehensive plan updates, redrafts of the zoning code, and subdivision regulations. I have been part of the Neighborhood Housing Relations Task Force and clearly understand the concerns, this will cause the university impact zone. And that's what Jim was talking about. Iowa City has committed a great deal of time and money to reduce density in this area through the university neighborhood partnership. When the city adopted the comprehensive plan, it recognized this concern and created the university neighborhood partnership to help level the playing field. I and other residents of older neighborhoods are concerned the proposed changes will further tip the scale in favor of investment companies and may actually lead to the displacement of affordable housing. The goal should always be finding zoning tools that will promote the creation as well as the preservation of affordable housing. There are endless solutions to every issue, and this one does not work for the long-term benefit of Iowa City. It should never be about warehousing people. People need basic amenities, green space, and community. This recommendation does not take into account the damage that will be done in the neighborhood impact zone. The near downtown neighborhoods are already very dense and lack parking. I would ask that at the very least you remove the university impact zone and the RNS 12 zone from this proposal. And she signs it Anne Freerks, community member and former planning and zoning chair. Um, and I'll just say a little bit about my situation too. Uh, again, I live in the 200 block of Fairchild. That's just right down the way from Polly Eyes Pizza. It's a great neighborhood. Um, and my house is in the historic district, the North Side Historic District. I do serve on the um, Historic Preservation Commission. I represent the North Side neighborhood. And um, I agree with what Ann has to say here. Um, my block is unique in that I'm in a historic home, and a lot of my neighbors are in the district with me, but across the street, we have the RNS 12 houses. Um, that could really affect uh, the look and feel of our neighborhood. It is already dense. It's already diverse, in my opinion. Um, 
My backyard borders a fourplex, and on the other side, there are multifamily houses that run along Dubuque Street. There are a lot of people there. I feel like we're doing our part as a, a community, just those few blocks there of creating a diverse and dense um, living environment. So thank you so much. Thank you, Deanna. Who's ever next? Hi, my name is Andy Martin. I am a remodeler here in town. I'm also a member of the HBA and I'm the president of the Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition. But I'm not speaking for those bodies today, I'm just speaking as a private person. Um, I really do appreciate you taking a look at this because it's uh, something that's near and dear to me. I've had many people ask me to build ADUs over the years. Uh, typically, it's the reason they ask is because they have a family member that they'd like to have close. I've never had a rental person ask me to build one. Um, and what usually happens is that I, have, I send in the bid and they end up not doing it because it's too expensive. And the reason for that is, as they've outlined, you know, you've got the restrictions on there now. I think if we did change the code a little bit, I think you would end up seeing private individuals may be able to do those more, uh, particularly with elderly parents or disabled people not having to have that extra space for a detached unit will be a big help because, you know, the traditional way that's done is a carriage house, right? You got the garage below and the building above. You'd have to have a really big lot in order to do that side by side to have a, you know, 1200 foot building and side by side in your lot. And it doesn't work, right, to have a disabled or elderly person climbing a full flight of stairs to get to their apartment. Uh, that just doesn't fly. So I think if we, can, if we can loosen these restrictions, you will end up seeing that kind of thing. And in that case, it is truly affordable housing because it's a lot less expensive than your other options, such as assisted living, you know, whatever those are. Those are thousands of dollars a month. So uh, I think this is a really important thing to look at and I appreciate you doing that. And if you can see it, a way to reduce that, I think that's who you're gonna be serving largely. Um, you also, in a, in a bigger picture, that's like the, the, the tiny look at it, but in a bigger picture, we're looking at choices here for the future. And one of the things I love about Iowa City is that it is consistently growing, right? Ever since it was founded, we grow slowly, but we grow every year. And the traditional form of growth that we have is out in the cornfields, you know, you spread out. And so now we're looking at the idea of becoming more dense. And I think that is the way of the future. You know, I, I think that is the sustainable way. And I think it's the smart way to go because you know, there's no reason to go out when you can go up or grow, grow more dense. And traditionally you grow, you grow more dense by having these huge multifamily buildings. You know, that's the way you can do it uh, under current code. And I think if we allow a little bit more flexibility here, you will see a way to gain density without gaining monolithic density, if that makes any sense. You know, you've got, you've got choices. Um, and I think I understand the concerns with, with students because I've lived in Iowa City for 30 years. You know, they're, they're, they're a fact. But we have the same choice with students as well. They're either gonna grow more dense in the area that they're allowed or they're gonna spread out. And that's, that's the facts of life. So I'm not gonna give you any specific recommendations that way. I do appreciate you looking at ADUs and if you can make them, uh, if you can make them more flexible and make them more inviting to people, I think you will see an uptick in them. But as we pointed out, you have 30, 52 in the past 30 years. I don't think you're gonna see 52 next month. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna be that kind of rapid growth. So just as a person in the industry, that's my take on it. Thank you. Andy, may I ask a question for you? It's for my own edification. Yeah. Um, what would be the price range to construct, a, say, a thousand foot um, standalone unit for an ADU in somebody's backyard, just roughly? 
Well, the last ADU, ADU that we built was about $180,000. And about 35 to 40 percent of that cost was the garage. Okay. So, and if you could knock that way down, then you're looking at, you know, that's that's roughly the half the price of a new home, you know. Roughly. So, without a garage, would you be saying like a range of 100 to 150 thousand? Yeah, something like that. Okay. And so then you're looking at, you know, what a half or a third of the price of a new home. So that is affordable. Is it truly affordable in the definition of affordable housing where it's going to appeal to people who are making 60% or less of median income? Probably not. It's probably not that type of affordable housing, but is it, is it useful and, and, and more affordable than traditional building? Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. Yep. Who's ever next? Hey there, um, Jared Note. I'm uh, from Market Street. Um, so, uh, my ask is that you maintain the owner occupancy requirement on ADUs. Uh, so, more specifically, I, I live in RNS 12 stabilization zone. I think when I think about stabilization, it's not necessarily a, there's no historic overlay. There's not. It's not about character. If those things are important to you, that's not what that's about. I think it's a recognition that you have or that that neighborhood was really under, um, a, was in a situation where it's an acknowledgement that, that the diversity of the neighborhood and the equity of the neighborhood was being flattened out by monoculture and frankly by a price insensitive monoculture. So what I mean by that is frankly it's students who are price insensitive and it's one type of people taking over that neighborhood as opposed to doing a stable, diverse neighborhood well, frankly, things that I'm caring about right now, which is how long can I stay in this neighborhood? I'm at midlife, I'd like to stay here. But in RNS 12, as we, um, if it, to the extent that it is opened up to free development, which is the, the, the auspices of this, of this report, is that you know, um, it's about choice. If we just free the market, the market will crowd in supply. And when we crowd in supply, it'll fix everything. Prices will fall. Good, good examples of where that doesn't work, it doesn't work in healthcare. It also doesn't work in housing. Last week, the Federal Reserve, certainly not a socialist body, had an excellent, excellent, excellent um, uh, presentation. It was about three hours. I'd recommend everyone watch it. To say, what do the data say about what actually drives affordable housing? And you actually do need requirements and mandates. That's what actually drives affordable housing. It's not the market and crowding in with supply. And I think we you know, don't have to, I've heard wonderful things about um, uh, at one of the, the city council meetings where people were, were, were speculating, well, I just imagine the wonderful things that the market will provide. And, um, and we don't necessarily have to imagine what the market provides because we have extant examples we can get on our feet or what I did was I just went on, I live in the neighborhood, but if, if, you, if you care to, you can always go on maps.google.com and, 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 and check out some of these, these examples. So, and, and just, I should say, the framework was really helpful. The feedback from the mayor was really helpful because he gave me first principles. What do we care about in Iowa City? It's not, it's not character, it's not ne necessarily historical stuff. It's affordability, it's diversity, and it's environmental impact. And if that, those are reasonable frameworks, I, I, and I thought that was reasonable guidance. I walked around my neighborhood and what concerns me? So I go, and we've really focused on that 900 block. It's really, um, uh, more specifically, if you want to go over to Jefferson, it's two blocks over, 900 blocks about four blocks down. And if we look at, for example, 942, 940, uh, uh, 944, it's a duplex that was put brand new, or relatively new, on an old home. It takes up the, almost the entire lot. What happened? Did it, afford, did it affect affordability or prices of those rental units didn't. What in the neighborhood didn't, didn't have it, and there's three of them in a row, so there's that's lots of additional housing supply, right? Presumably that should have some impact. The market is crowded in supply, no impact on affordability. What did it impact? Well, culture, it's now monoculture, it's really that, so that we've got that, so now we've have, it's, there's no more diversity, it's adult students on that, that particular area of the block. That may, that may be what we want. 
Um, but I don't think that creates a thriving neighborhood where people are invested and investing in the community continually and keeping this alive and generative community. And what do we have in terms of environmental impact? Are people really not using their cars to get around? Well, if you walk around the corner, you'll see that, well, we have no more trees. We have no crown, we have no cover. We have a heat sink. We've come into an, we've really become a concrete jungle. And that drives up air conditioning in the summer. When people's no one's in there, the rest of the neighborhoods are feeling it. Um, and then if you just walk through their backyard, what you'll see over there on 923 Market Street, my block, um, cute little house, torn down, middle, middle of the block. Um, make, I don't know what is going to get, go in there, but I can speculate that it might be another very, very large duplex. I don't think it'll have an appreciable impact on, on, um, on affordability, but I think almost certainly in terms of the environmental impact, things will get hotter, fewer trees, more parking spaces, people are still using their cars, uh, less diversity, and again, no real measurable impact on affordability. Appreciate you considering um, keeping the, uh, the owner occupancy. Sorry. Thank you, Jared. Thanks. Who's ever next? <clears throat> They have copies at their place, but we can pass them around if you want. I think we already have those. I can also, yeah. you would ask to have it up, I believe. Oh, that's I can great. pop it up. Hi, my, my name's Sharon DeGraw, and I live in the North Side neighborhood. And yeah, I think it works if you want to scroll top half and then bottom half when it goes there. Um, so from where I live, I'm, I'm most concerned about the university impact zone. And I, I have a survey of street, streetscapes with what it looks like parking-wise in the north side neighborhood, some on South Lucas Street. And it's really the university impact zone, the role that parking plays. And, and so I'm concerned about the waiver of the parking aspect of the ADUs. Um, so the, the first image is, that's the 400 block of North Gilbert Street, and there are cars on the correct side of the street that you need to park on all day long from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And once it turns 5 o'clock, you'll start to see cars showing up on the other side of the street. and. And even so, you're only supposed to park on one side. You can find errant cars parking on the wrong side of the street, and they just accept the ticket. Um, the second half of that slide is the 500 block of Gilbert Street. And these streets are not terribly wide. It's hard for, I've been at this area with a delivery driver parking a truck to go run food in and to a, a dwelling, to a house. And cars were just piling up on either side for about five minutes. And then people start to get testy because they can't back up and they're just stuck until the delivery person finds the right residence and recipient. Um, so I'm, I'm imagining if we start to add ADUs to some of these lots and don't have the parking requirement, people are still gonna bring their cars and this situation's gonna get worse. Um, the next slide is, so closer into the downtown, you'll see plenty of lots where on the alley side, very little green space is left and there are virtual parking lots. Um, we're not supposed to be doing that as much anymore, but you can see how densely packed in the parking is. Um, I don't know that these could be converted to have an ADU, but if they did, where would the cars go? And students are gonna bring their cars. Um, let's see, at the AD op ADU open house, I expressed my concern about the parking waiver for ADUs. In response, staff said, students will learn to leave their vehicles at home, meaning like most likely at their parents' residences. Um, and I thought that's strange, that's not really gonna happen after all. 
Um, and in addition, a Thinking about the AARP aspect of the recommendation for ADUs, if you think about the university impact zone, there's really not going to be a lot of seniors looking for their <coughs> accessory dwelling unit in the back of a, a down, close to downtown house, rental house. Um, so to me, it's illogical that Iowa City will see an increase in seniors living in ADUs in the university impact zone, um, very close to the downtown. And the next image is when I drop my kids off from school, I often go see a friend on Lucas Street, South Lucas, after dropping them off. And I've been stuck behind maybe the same garbage truck many times. And today I just snapped an image of like, here we go again, there's a car on the other side that can't make it through. So already the, the streets are very packed with automobiles. The streets are narrow. If you increase the density at this point, I don't think that you're gonna convince the students to leave their cars at home. And this car did a three-point turn to get out of the way and turn around. And I've been in situations where it took five minutes for people to figure out, like some cars will dive into a driveway, others will back up, and others like this one will do a three-point turn to get back around. Um, and this is the 300 block of North Street, Lynn Street, where I actually used to live. And uh, this is when I first moved to Iowa City as a young professional, and I lived in the Palais building. And I would strategically drive my car down to the end of the block and use that as my jogging uh, exercise every morning. I would try to get out there to fetch my car and try to find a new parking spot for it. And I'm from California. I didn't have parents where I could leave a, a car somewhere else and then get it occasionally. Um, I would prepay my parking tickets because I knew that was the best rate. I just put down $100 every month or so, except the number of parking tickets that I would accumulate not getting there in time. Did I run my five minutes out? Oh, OK. We we'll just wrap it up, Sharon. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Who's ever next? Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Melvin. I live on um, South Van Buren. Uh, I just wanted to add a different perspective uh, sort of to this conversation, which is the perspective um, of a student, and especially um, as relates to the parking uh, aspect of this, uh, to sort of echo the sentiments of what was just said. Uh, I, if the ADUs are targeted as an affordable housing mechanism for students, uh, I think the basic reality with the students is that there's an expectation that they will have a car here, and that whatever sort of um, adverse parking requirements you know come from that it's that they're going to have their car here one way or another uh, for that reason I think that the requirement of a parking spot per ADU should stay uh, if it's removed you can have an, an increase in density without an increase of uh, sort of set aside parking spots but you're still going to see the same increase in um, cars at least um, provided this is being uh, targeted towards um, students uh, if it's being targeted towards um, elderly residents or you know family members for extended families in a singular unit, um, in that case, I think the owner occupancy requirement should probably stay. Um, if it's the case that we're looking for you know affordable housing for um, those sorts of uh, different family situations to incorporate it onto the same house, then there's no reason to remove the owner occupancy. Um, requirement and what that does is it does help to prevent and some of these concerns have already been uh, expressed but it, it helps to remove any possibility of the sort of speculative real estate investment um, from happening and it can keep it you know keep the homes concentrated in um, you know local residents and local companies rather than allowing it to be um, a source of investment speculation um, so depending on uh, what the intended or imagined goal of um, loosening some of the restrictions from the ADUs uh, would be it seems as though either the owner occupancy requirement should stay uh, and or the parking requirement should stay so thank you thank you Jonathan who's ever next
Hi, I wear a lot, I'm Lorraine Bowens. I wear a lot of hats around here. Uh, I lived on South Governor Street for over 30 years um, in an old house built in 1864. I'm very passionate about the historic homes, the older neighborhoods and everything. And you can, our house was a duplex when we moved in. We converted it back to a single family. When we built a garage at the back of the property, we put frost footings so we could build an addition up for thinking the time my parents would come to live with us. But I'm also on the board of Johnson County Livable Communities. I'm a realtor. I also work with helping seniors find services. And I'm very active, becoming very active with, politically for seniors and living with dignity as we age. Um, I'm also an active vol volunteer and advocate for AARP. So I cover a lot of areas. So I do not want to, I, I am a firm believer where I differentiate from AARP in our town. We need to keep it owner occupied to preserve what f little housing stock we have left that's historic. We don't have a lot. And ADUs do not have to be an extra building. I mean, our old house on South Governor Street, when we lived there, there was probably nine houses that used to be rooming houses or duplexes or triplexes that were converted to single family. They could be converted back. You, and uh, the lots were 190 feet. You can put a small unit in the back and still have a good neighborhood. And with the historic and conservation districts, they have to stay blended so you're not gonna have an ugly thing. Right now in real estate, real estate's not that great right now. I mean, the interest rates are high. Building is expensive. I think Andy can attest to that. You don't see as much development taking down old homes to build a lot of new stuff. That could change in the future, but right now that's not the case. Um, and, but the owner occupied, having trying to call 20 nursing homes, trying to find housing for someone who has no money, it's heartbreaking. And this is an opportunity for seniors or young family people. When we age, we wanna live in our neighborhood. To do that, we can't live in the two-story house where the only bathroom may be on the second floor. We could, but it may not be safe. We could build an addition onto our house. Matter of fact, on Governor Street, the house catty corner from us, they could no longer do the stairs. They built an addition of a master suite onto their home did not detract from the neighborhood. Still plenty of room for parking and everything like that. So we need to have design standards that really preserve some of the lot and the integrity of the older homes. Um, we are infant stages now of trying to find out a way where seniors could stay in their neighborhoods, in their homes, maybe build a smaller unit in the back where they could either move into and rent the big house to a larger family and have them do provide services for them. Or for them to stay in their home, have a small unit either attached or separate where they could have a student who has been vetted, has background checks and everything, move in and it's a win-win for both. Less student debt for the student and services for the senior. Iowa is closing nursing homes like crazy. They, I've been to several meetings with the um, head of the Department of Human Services, the director of Medicaid Services, and the director of Aging and Disability Services. Their plan, and, and there's a lot of things going on now, nothing's been set in stone, but they're shuttering nursing homes because one, we have no care workers, they don't pay enough, Medicaid does not reimburse enough. So we are gonna have a crisis of there's no place for people in Iowa with lower income to move to. So people are forced to stay in their homes. So I look at this at a whole different perspective. If we could somehow benefit a teacher who's coming here to work, fresh out of college, 
She's gonna have student loans to pay back. If we can have an affordable unit for her to live in, and then it's a win-win if she can do some cares for the senior or a family that's coming in. And so anyway, there are work, the state is working on ways to finance ADUs for lower income people. The Iowa Finance Authority is working on some things and the state is also going to try and work on some things to get homes modified for this particular situation. So I have a little context all over. So there's a lot of things in the work that I hope will all come through, but it's, I just kind of want people to think outside the box. And you know, when you have to call 20 places to find Radio somebody living, yeah, all right, thank you. Who's ever next? Hi, my name is Alex Lewis. I, and just for some background context, I'm currently in the middle of a research project on the way land use reform can increase affordability. So I thought a few statistics might help couch the conversation. So the Council of Economic Advisors recognized that there's about 7 million market rate affordable units in the country, which means that someone at the defined poverty line could afford the rent at their current salary. Two and a half million of those are being occupied by people that could afford an up market unit, but don't because there's no supply up market. That means that millions of units that could be affordable today aren't on the market. So when we talk about market rate, versus affordable, versus addressing the affordability crisis, that is all the same conversation about supply. So when we talk about what's happening in neighborhoods, how to stop the change of neighborhoods, you know, where are students moving? Apparently we're not very well liked. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be here, there's a university here, sorry. <laughs> we're coming, the demand is constant and it's gonna grow. It's only a question of whether it's inelastic student demand because we're coming here with the money to afford any kind of rent. I can tell you I worked for a few years and I lived in Dallas. When I came to town, my rent money was gonna go anywhere. So I'm gonna go where I can afford and where I can live. But that doesn't necessarily mean that students are immune to market pressure. If there's a more dense area, that's more amenable to students. They can bike, they can walk, they're closer to downtown, they can go to bars. And that brings us to the car issue too, which I can get to in a second. But you have to address where that supply exists so that they don't grow out. You know, someone else made a great point about growing out into cornfields versus growing up. Students like more dense housing. They like being closer to other people. ADUs are a way of enabling that and making sure that students are gonna stay closer to where the university is. Because as you all discussed the impact area, that's where students want to be. So if you want to keep people closer to the university, if you want to mean less and less people are getting priced out of those areas, it means making sure that more students can live on one lot. If there's 10 students coming to town, either five of them can live on one lot or two of them can live on five lots. So it seems like for everyone, students, homeowners, the community, it would be better to have students in more dense areas on less lots. And it removes the pressure from the historic districts and other issues like that. The car issue is another big one. The cars are the problem. Cars and density are inverse. They're against each other. And you know, there's a great saying I love, which is you know, you're not in traffic, you are the traffic. When we're looking at pictures of people stuck in traffic and watching people do three-point turns, you're also the one sitting behind the garbage truck and blocking the person in the white car. None of us want to be in that traffic jam. The way you encourage that is by getting more people out of their cars, biking, walking to school, which we would all love to do, I promise. Cars are expensive, we don't have that much money. <laughs> so that's other policies like protected bike lanes, things like that, that are part and parcel of this. But increasing density and reducing parking makes it overall more attractive. You know, we heard about the building costs associated with garages, but there's also space constraints. Cars are big, and if you're acquiring a place for a car on every lot that pushes the units further out, it reduces the density of the area, and it means people have to have their cars. There's a great statistic uh, from some reform in Buffalo that showed that for the doubling of housing density, uh, transportation emissions reduced almost 50%, and household heating costs reduced by 40%. That means it's also more affordable. When those units are closer together, 
especially like in an apartment building or a multi-unit situation, you don't have five exposed sides, you have four exposed sides or three exposed sides, which means less heating, less cooling costs. All of that makes the situation more affordable. And as far as the investor concerns and owner occupancy concerns, that's a, even in the most aggressive markets, New York, San Francisco, LA, only about 8% of units at the high end are being owned by incorporated entities. Most of these units are local people who are just looking for another stream of income, a, ability to monetize their lot to retire, things of that nature. So it's good to keep those avenues open and we shouldn't be artificially constraining ability to build because that's just gonna harm supply. You know, people talked earlier about uh, why we haven't seen changes in the market, but 52 units over 30 years isn't something you're gonna notice, especially when the university is growing and the town is growing. You need to take serious supply side reforms seriously so that people can respond to that. There is money to be made for people in this community by monetizing their lots, by increasing density, by taking advantage of us students with our inelastic demand coming here and spending. So it's good to be able to capture that and get rid of the car requirement. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Who's ever next? Hi, my name is Kelsey Patrick Ferre. I live on Sandusky Drive in the South District. Um, I'm here because I support these proposed changes to the zoning code to increase the availability and diversity of housing in Iowa City. I support all of the changes that our city staff have proposed. Um, I appreciate the students who are in the room tonight pointing out that they do need housing and it's better for them to have housing closer to the university so they've got walking opportunities. Um, personally, ideally, I'd love to have a few more grocery stores in that area so they don't have to be driving out to get food. Um, I think if some of the homeowners who have come to object to these changes would add ADUs to their homes and rent to students, I think some of them might find they actually like having students around more than they realize. We rented a room in our house to a student a few years ago for a brief period of time. And a few weeks ago, my husband officiated at his wedding. He's a dear friend, and he's part of our lives now. Um, but... All of that said, um, as I've listened to all of these concerns that have been raised and read all of the reports and everything, I think that one potential solution for the university <coughs> impact zone presents itself. Um, part of it is what Jim Throckmorton mentioned before, which is only allowing ADUs to be built on properties that are owner occupied except for also allowing uh, nonprofits to. But then the second part of that is to divorce that ownership requirement from um, future ownership of the property. So reading through the packet, my understanding from some of the things that were in there that the staff said is that the owner occupancy requirement presents a big problem for future uses of that um, dwelling unit. The, both the main house and the dwelling unit. And um, so I think that if we can separate those two requirements, the building requirement and the renting requirement, um, that would be a good way forward just within the university impact zone. Um, what that could look like is either a general lack of requirement of owner occupancy to get, get a rental permit for an ADU or it could be a provision that says that once the unit has been sold, once the house plus ADU has been sold to someone else or otherwise transferred, like a transfer on death deed, um, the owner occupancy requirement no longer applies to that property. And I think that would solve a lot of the problems that we're seeing raised here today. Now, again, I want to be clear, this isn't actually what I'm advocating for. I like the city staff's um, recommendations. I just wanted to put that out there because I think that it would be helpful for you all if you need to find a compromise position. Thank you very much. 
Who's ever next? Second call for the first go around. Okay, we'll go to the second go around. If anybody would like to speak again, they have two minutes. Please don't repeat what you said the first time. If you have new information, this is a great opportunity to share it. So anybody would like to speak again for two minute limit? And Jared, if you'd say Hey, it's name. Jared Note again. Um, just, just a point of clarification. Um, I don't think anyone wants this, there, there's it being a false antagonism, which I don't think is generative, nor is it representative, I think, of what anyone's saying here. I think what we want are stable communities that are diverse, that are affordable, and that are environmentally responsible. And that, re, that is what, um, uh, what might be unlocked by having ADUs available to owner-occupied buildings, where we could have, as opposed to having um, hollowing out diverse communities and rebuilding a monoculture, and we have existing examples of where that happens, and in particular in the stabilization uh, area of, of RNS-12 as one example, other areas of the impact zone might be also be relevant here. Um, I think uh, I just want to, this is more of a course, a, 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 a comment of clarification um, that I think a false antagonism or an, an interpretation of antagonism is not representative, I think, of many of the opinions put forth, but rather how can we have really, um, again, those principle, the, those three principles, affordability, diversity, and environmental um, uh, responsibility, I think that's uh, part of what we want from having a, um, a generative community. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for two minutes? Hi, Jim Throgmorton again. Uh, I want to be clear that nothing I or anyone else affiliated with the Northside Neighborhood Association has said should be understood as being opposed to rental units in the neighborhood. I think you know from previous presentations that a, a very large proportion of the housing in the Northside neighborhood already is rental. Apartment buildings, rooming houses, uh, single family structures that have been converted to three, four, five, six, seven, and nine family structures. So the problem for many people in the north side is not that there are renters in the neighborhood, it's that pressure exists, and, and the, the amendments you're considering would increase the pressure. Pressure exists to convert pretty much all of the north side, I don't want to exaggerate too much, uh, pretty much all of the north side to rental units. So the, the, the challenge is to make it possible for owner occupants to actually live in the neighborhood instead of feeling pressured by market forces to move out. So it's not hostility toward renters, not hostility toward students. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else like to speak for a two minute time limit? Andy. Yeah. Andy Martin again. Um, all I wanted to talk about quickly was the parking requirement. And uh, I was talking to a guy who lives in Solon and apparently they have kind of regressed in their parking requirements there and they're requiring more parking. Something, uh, I'm not going to speak to that because I don't know the details, but he was saying basically they're requiring more parking in Solon per unit now. And he's like, we are the only, he, he spoke before the city council, and he said, we are the only town in the country that is trying to create more uh, rights for cars. He's like, look, if you've got a street, that's where the car belongs. Put the car on the street. You don't need to create more parking lots for cars. You know, let's, let's shrink that up so that cars are where they belong, on the street. And I think that's something you should consider that we want to build for people and not for cars. I know that's the way we've been kind of heading the last few years, and I, I think it's great. When we went to two lanes on Mormon Trek, I thought we were crazy, but now I love it. You know, that kind of thing. So uh, uh, I would encourage you not to try and build for, you know, allow more room for cars in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Second call of Sharon. Hi, Sharon DeGragan. And I'll, I'll add that I do love where I live because of the number of, of students that live all around. 
it's just the, the density is quite, it's there, it's great, but I'm not sure how much more we can go. Um, there was a report that Jerry Anthony helped compiled along with graduate students, and it has an interesting statistic that I thought I would share. It's not in the presentation. And it's, um, let me see if I can get it. So it talks about um, tax revenue, but then think of tax revenue translated as density. For the north side, we have 91 cents per uh, square foot is the tax revenue created out of the north side neighborhood, and that's translated as density. For the Weber neighborhood, it's 31 cents per square foot of space, and for Windsor Ridge, it is 24 cents. Um, so if other areas took on a little density, and if the ADU component works well outside the university impact zone, with or without parking requirement, with or without uh, landlord or owner occupied, I see more possibility there. But just within the the U University impact area, I think we're doing quite well right now. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Second call for two minute limit. Seeing no one approaching, we'll close the public hearing. Um, if I could, I'll entertain a motion to discuss this item. Keep in mind that there are nine proposed standards um, by city staff. We could have a motion to approve all nine. You could have a motion to uh, drop out a certain one um, and or some, some other variant. Mm -hmm. And I'd ask you to include in your, in your motion language to change it from uh, to ADUs rather than what, what do we currently call it? We call them accessory apartments, accessory and it would be apartments. accessory dwelling units. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion. I move that Title 19, that Title 14 zoning be amended with elimination of the standard that the owner is not required to live on site. I don't know where the ADU goes in there. But in that, um, yeah. Could you give us a suggested wording for that, Kirk? And that where accessory apartment is in the zoning code, that it be replaced with the term uh, accessory dwelling unit. All right. Is there a second for that motion? Question first. So you're not limited, limiting this to the university impact? Zone. I am not. So you. Can you? Uh, yeah, it was clear right, to me. Um, I'm so sorry. So are we leaving it uh, only to rent? renter occupied or for everybody I'm proposing that the uh, that we leave it as is that it might, that the um, like what the city one, recommended no oh. I'm recommending that it remain as is okay. that the owner it, it needs to be owner occupied oh well, okay but you're to right. clarify but you're it's the you other eight that. standards you're okay well, with right you just are opposed to the standard that would drop the requirement for the owner to occupy a one of the dwelling units in that property. Right. If you look at, I think there's nine. I I am for eight. <laughs> I'm proposing that we eliminate the the owner. I want to. I want that to remain as owner occupied. And Scott, did you did you second that? Uh, no. Okay. I thought I heard somebody. Okay. Was there a second for that? Because we can't discuss it without a second. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second it. Okay, second by Wade. Kirk, I wonder if you could pull up attachment four. Does that show it, it in a way that... I was just about to do... Well, I don't it's know on if this... page 93. 80, excuse me. Yes, 93. I don't know if this is going to be super helpful. It might be easier for me to... Right. Yeah, this slide's going to be easier probably. Um, Page three. I mean, basically, it's one. right there. Four, two, yeah. right. This one's the easier one to look at, probably. Right. One, two, three. So the third. Whoop. Sorry. I have to put up the Zoom meeting so that everyone can see it too. So I'm saying the proposed standards for eight, for all eight, except for the third one down, and that would remain as a current standard. 
not concerned about parking. I'm not concerned about parking. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Um, Maggie, since you made the motion, you can go first for discussion. Um, well, I appreciate the extra work that the staff has gone to and uh, the people who came to the forum and the people here tonight. Um, I do believe that loosening our current regulations on ADUs will contribute to our strategic goal of attractive and affordable housing for all people. My concern is with the proposed standard to eliminate the requirement for owner occupancy. The majority of the attendees at the ADU and tonight um, had concerns about removing the owner-occupied requirement. Um, removing the requirement places a greater burden on the university impact zone and also um, like the Longfellow zone that's not in the university impact zone but our older neighborhoods um, where there are more rental units in the area. If one of the goals is to stabilize and preserve the neighborhoods, the character of older neighborhoods, then allowing for ADUs with the owner on site helps to preserve the character of those neighborhoods. Um, that's my, that's why I'm going that direction. All right. Um, Chad, do you want to, you second it, do you want to go next? Go ahead. Okay. Um, as I've said before, I'm a big fan of ADUs because I believe strongly in intergenerational housing and that's um, why I support ADUs. Interestingly, in the last issue of the Planning Magazine that just came out, um, there was a discussion, um, as, as was referenced in the presentation, AARP and the APA, American Planning Association, have collaborated to come up with these standards. And they issued a report for that. I found it interesting in this article that the main justification they give for these new standards actually validate what the motion is. And I'll just quote this, it says, we can point out that, say, creating an accessory dwelling unit ordinance in our town might allow you to build a unit in the backyard of your mother, your mother or house a caregiver if you need care, or it can act as an income generating source for you. So in their own justifications, they're saying that the reason you should have these ADUs is because you're occupying that place, and this is for caregivers for you, or intergenerational housing, or income generation for you. So I just found it interesting that they specifically, in their recommendations, say there shouldn't be a requirement about the owner on site, but their justification says that's exactly what it actually should be. There should be an owner on site. And I agree 100% with that. So I would so, uh, uh, support the motion as stated. So I, I'd like to make one point on that. Um, I, I would generally be in favor of removing the, over, the owner occupancy requirement. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that um, you know, when you do that, you encourage investment into ADUs, which I think you know, do a really nice job of balancing these concerns we have of uh, you know, bringing down the cost of housing while also avoiding excessive density. Um, and when we talk about people creating ADUs on their property, you know, one thing that staff noted uh, are that these folks are having trouble getting financing because they go to the bank and the bank says, you know, we're not going to give you a mortgage because if something were to happen to you, um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily, or, or your successor wouldn't be able to continue to run out this ADU. Um, so I, I think that uh, removing owner occupancy requirements uh, is in the best interest not only of developers but also in the interest of you know normal people that would want to build ADUs on their property but not, might not have the funds to do so. I'm also in favor of removing the requirement. So I, I would support the motion with all of these recommendations. I'm in favor of removing the requirement too. As a compromise, I could, I could I could support a position that um, left that requirement in the university impact zone and removed it elsewhere. Just, just one thing. Um, I understand that I'm sure the impetus for a lot of this is to increase, um, to decrease the cost of housing. I honestly don't think this will have anything other than a marginal impact for even if we allowed unrestricted ADU growth. That's not the driver of the housing costs in Iowa City. 
I don't think growth is of ADUs is going to run rampant in any case in any neighborhood in the next few years myself. Yeah. But well, I think it's, it's hard to predict the future. Yeah, it's a pretty strong statistic. In the last 30 years, there's been 52 units or 1.7 ADUs per year. I understand there's some more restrictions on that, but as Mr. Martin stated, I'm in a you know, at a hundred to hundred fifty thousand dollars from ADU, it's a very limited number of people that have affordability for that. And my fear is that a limited number of people are in the investor class, mm -hmm. or um, people who are not going to live in the neighborhood, but are, will spend the money because they know they can rent that out for the next forty years, so they can afford to build that ADU. So I'm really concerned about neighborhood integrity. So my turn. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I guess my concern is when I think of affordable housing, I think of housing for families that are going to remain in the communities. I think the ADU is a good idea for seniors and for people that want to keep their families together. But I, I, would, like, I would like to see that uncoupled from calling it affordable housing um, because I think it's a whole different um, entity than just affordable housing. Uh, if, and if you take out that owner um, occupancy piece of it, it just becomes an, another money maker for whoever. Um, they're going to rent out the big unit and rent out the small unit, and there's going to be no um, no one there to say, okay, are they going to keep up the unit? Um, what's that going to do with the neighbor do to the neighborhood? Um, I'm on I'm up from the Mayflower, and there's lots of <laughs> lots of big yards in that area. But it's still a community. It's a nice neighborhood. Um, and I can see building ADUs that are not on the uh, land with the owner becoming just rentals. There are a lot of rental homes in our neighborhood, but their owners live across the street. So they've bought units on the other side of the street. So they're kept up. But I've also seen properties in the Iowa City area where that's not happening, where the, especially around the university, where some of those places are just, just run down, where they, they, they tack them up just enough to get the students in, and then they're falling apart. So I think we need to keep that owner, owner uh, piece in there. Chad? Yeah, uh, so the reason I seconded that motion, uh, or went with the owner occupancy uh, requirement, um, is really an incremental approach to it um, for the same uh, concerns as I had last time. Um, you know, it does become an opportunity for a private uh, owner uh, on premises to make that property more affordable um, as their ownership uh, for creating a rental unit to help uh, supplement uh, the cost of the house. As we're all aware, uh, cost of housing is expensive right now um, and you know anything to kind of help that or level the playing field um, however I have the same concerns that that requirement um, is not going to get us any closer uh, to the goal from a walkability uh, from uh, being close to downtown um, uh, as far as getting more housing on the market um, so if this doesn't promote um, or uh, show results in increased uh, utilization or um, development of ADUs, then uh, I, I would look to revisit that requirement after uh, a year or two to see if, if that needs to be uh, lifted. Further discussion? Scott, did I, you have, or I Maria? I have a question. I have a question for staff. So, for example, if I wanted to rent a property for my family with an ADU for my parents, for example, I, could, I couldn't do that because I wouldn't be the owner, right? You wouldn't be living there yourself. You, you would have to live on the property to be able to do that. No, no, but if it, if it wasn't my house. Yeah, if you rented out the main unit and tried to rent to your parents on a different unit, you could not do that, no. Okay. If you bought the ADU, if you bought the property no, with the ADU no, and, no. and you didn't live there, 
No, but if I say, let's say I don't want to buy a house. I want to oh. rent a house and live in the main property with my husband, my kids, and then rent a house that has an ADU so I can, right. no. so I can put yeah. my parents you, in yeah, there. If you didn't it wouldn't be my it, house, but I wouldn't be. It. Yeah, and I wouldn't be able to take care of my parents. But if you had, but you could, if there was a house that was owned by Susan next door that had an ADU, <laughs> you could put your parents in there. No, no because it, Susan owns a house. As long as Susan's living on oh, site. Oh, okay. So they wouldn't be in the same property. Okay, okay. But you have to look out and. Okay. You'd have to right find an owner occupied me. property. Okay. And understand. Susan would take care of your parents. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Thank basement you, that could be an ADU. <laughs> Scott? Yeah, no, I, I, I was just going to, you know, additionally say in support of ADUs that, um, you know, I, I mean, looking at the statistics that staff presented, I, I thought it was pretty compelling in terms of just how few of these properties have been constructed. Um, so I, I think, you know, to the extent we favor an incremental approach, you know, eliminating the owner occupancy requirement, I don't think is, is liable to result in, you know, dozens or hundreds of, of ADUs overnight. Um, I, I think that's a process that would happen fairly slowly. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, ADUs are still subject to other zoning requirements, right? So it's, we're not just packing places uh, onto tiny lots that are not suitable for them. I mean, you still have to meet setback requirements, and there's still a, a variety of provisions in the zoning code that ensure that ADUs are, are consistent with the character of the community. Um, so, I, I mean, I strongly support ADUs. I, I think that we could eliminate the owner occupancy requirement and wouldn't see drastic change. And in the very unlikely event that, you know, we did start seeing an adverse impact to our community, um, you know, there's nothing stopping us from coming back and revisiting that regulation and making further recommendations to the council. So we'll go ahead and call the question. This is a motion by Elliot, a second by Wade. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. 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 So, okay, um, for nays, would you just state your name, please? Craig. Craig. Padron. Drone. Quillhurst. So the motion passes four to three. We'll go on to the next item. Item number five, consideration of meeting minutes from August 16th, 2023. Are there any major corrections or additions to those minutes as posted or as, as placed in the packet? Move approval. Motion by Craig, is there a second? Second. Second by Quillhorst. Discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of approving the minutes from August 16th, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Hearing no nays, the motion is approved 7-0. Next item, planning and zoning information. All right, we have a few uh, projects that we just wanted, <coughs> development projects that we wanted to update you on. Um, the, if you remember the rezoning across from the fire station on Dodge and Scott um, with the proposed coffee shop, mixed use building and townhomes, that was recently subdivided and approved by council. Um, the site plan was also recently approved, so there, there may be some activity out there soon. Um, uh, several months ago, has it been years? I don't know, out on um, Melrose and Slothower, remember that rezoning, annexation, rezoning, and subdivision. Um, they came back for a resubdivision, um, which I believe only council saw. So they, uh, they're, maybe, maybe you guys saw it too. It was, maybe it was preliminary plat um, and final plat. So they're proposing some additional lots and streets out there. That was, that was approved by council at the last meeting. Sure. Some additional what? Lots and a couple streets okay. that they're proposing, which weren't included in the original proposal. Um, the local landmark rezoning of the original Emma Goldman Clinic was a approved last night. Um, the rest of the housing code amendments, or zoning code amendments related to housing, the first reading passed at council. Last night they deferred the second consideration to the next meeting, so we'll be preparing some additional information for council. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention was we are working on a grant application to HUD for pro housing. I'll let Kirk talk about that because he spent a ton of time on it. Yeah, so it, the goal is to address barriers to housing choice. So it's a lot of the sort of similar things that we see in our amendments that we've been proposing. Um, 
but it can be anything from, you know, changing your planning documents to try to support those things. It can be anything from building projects or things like that. So we, we submitted a grant application, or we've prepared a grant application that, that will go before council at their next meeting. Uh, it would request $5.6 million in federal funds. We would match it. Uh, we're proposing that we would match it with $2.85 million. Um, so pretty, pretty good chunk of money that's available. Uh, grants can go up to $10 million. Um, the activities that we're proposing are kind of a continuation of a lot of things that we've, we've already been able to, to move forward over the last several years. Um, so that does include uh, trying to really expand the scope of our comprehensive plan update that we're doing specifically as we're looking at our housing element, looking at our regional housing study, uh, also looking at a land use element uh, that, that really does reflect the, the desires of the community. Uh, we've also had parking as something to look at as a long-term barrier to affordable housing that we've heard about quite a bit. Um, so we would want to do a parking study as part of that, possibly bring uh, proposed changes to the parking standards. Uh, we're also talking about uh, looking at if the city can directly develop affordable housing rather than using RFPs to develop affordable housing. And when I say affordable, income restricted affordable housing. Um, so that would include funding for a pilot project that would hopefully be able to produce 24 dwelling units that would be affordable, uh, that would kind of kickstart uh, a, a city development arm or a, a housing authority development arm. Um, in addition to other activities that address more immediate needs, so looking at some sort of uh, kind of emergency assistance fund that would help with rent for folks who, who might become unhoused otherwise, look at security deposit for folks that can't find housing otherwise, um, for doing housing, housing counseling, uh, as part of the housing authority and those sorts of things. So lots of related things. Long story short, we have a comment period right now. Uh, it is available actionplan at icgov.org slash action plan. Uh, or if you go to the main page, you'll find a news article that will link you to the pro housing grant application. Uh, we're in that comment period, so we'd encourage you to go take a look at it, look through the activities. I'm sure that there's a couple that I missed in reading those off um, and and provide feedback uh, with the feedback that you provide. You know, we'll provide comments uh, or a staff response to that. That'll all be provided to council. So we encourage you to come take a look at it. Those in the public too, uh, go take a look at it. Uh, and oh, an accessory dwelling unit program. That's something I want to mention. That would provide funds to to produce uh, accessory dwelling units that would help owners. Uh, so anyway, I encourage you to to go take a comment period, and then there will also be comments accepted at uh, the council's next meeting. I have a question. Sure. I heard on the news this week that they are going to start to charge for the electric charging stations. How will that affect building when they're putting in those units now? Are we, some of those, I know we've asked them to put the, have those units as well, part of the package. Yeah, so rental, or I mean, residential properties are exempt. My understanding is that it applies to commercial and public properties. Um, residential would be exempt. We would, the, the EV standards are something that uh, we still intend to bring back to you. Um, I just, I just, but, but we would probably recommend that it only be required for residential properties then because of that change. And there should be curious. grant funds that are available to help with that too, so. That's how it would change our proposal. Again, that's, we've been focusing on other priorities at the moment. Just two things. Um, Cause I have less than a year and a half left on here and there's two items I'd like us to discuss sometime in the future. One is I, I really think the, the borders of the university impact zone need to be looked at. They, it just, they don't seem correct to me. I don't know when the last time they were updated. But if it's truly a university impact zone, we should really make sure that it's accurate. So at some time, I'd like to discuss that. And then the other thing, and this is a minor thing, but it drives me crazy. You know, all throughout town, there's these flood detention areas. Mostly, they're the responsibility of HOAs to maintain, but they don't maintain them. They just abandon them. So it seems to me this would be an opportunity to maybe to restore those areas, leave them flood Build detention an areas. On top. 
<laughs> work. But like, dude, if and we stilts. had a, a pollinator requirement for our prairie restoration, because they don't need maintenance other than burn it or mow it once every five years or something like that. So maybe that'd be a way to address the issue of HOAs who do not maintain them and they just get overgrown with shrubs. So I don't really know they'd ever work as a flood detention area anyway. So I would like to discuss that sometime. And I really encourage everybody, if you don't read this carefully, there's great ideas in this. I, I don't have a single original idea, but <laughs> stuff from here. this is really worth your time, especially since we pay nothing for it. <laughs> so I just really encourage you to read that. I don't think I get that. Well, you should speak to them if you don't get it. Yeah. Do I get, do I get it electronically? You can. So feel free to speak to us. Oh, oh okay. I All of it. you are members of the American Planning Association. And you should be getting their emails. You should be getting Planning Magazine. Chad, are you getting it? Uh, not the... No emails? I get, I get emails. emails. I read the emails, but not the paper. I'll call them and see what's going I on. I get the paper. You get the paper? I think magazine? I get the magazine and the emails. Yeah, I, me too. I think you have to opt in. There's like a profile that you might have to opt in to the paper version. I'm assuming that's what's happening. So you probably have access to the digital version of the magazine, would be my guess. I get the paper. Yeah. I, I mean, I get the paper too, but... Yeah. Well... I have a question for Ann that I gave her a heads up, which came out of reading an email from the APA, and I admitted to her that I often just hit delete. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting to me, it was about zoning for home occupations and, and how that world has changed so much in the last yes. 10, let alone 20 years. Um, because so many people are working from home and what kind of work are they doing? And it's not always obvious, even to their neighbors, that they could be running a business out of their home, which I really, I don't care if they do or not. But it was just interesting to me. And I gave Anna a heads up that I was gonna ask her what, what our zoning regulations are for home occupation. Yes, thanks for the heads up. Cause we actually don't deal with home occupations. Um, even though it is in the zoning code, we have other staff that deal with home occupation so permits. we don't have anything for home-based business? We do, but yeah. planning staff doesn't yeah. oh, okay. implement that section of the code. Okay. But how, um, how, does that how, does that, how is that different from people that now work at home even though they're part of a company. Yeah, I think that's that's just, that's, so what I wanted to, to say is that the state actually preempted us t to some extent on how we regulate home-based home business. If you work at home and like, and it's via Zoom or whatever all day, that's, that's a no impact home-based business, business per the state code and we can't require a permit. So if, if it's considered, state code has this thing called no impact home-based business, which is any business that doesn't create traffic or there's no, the neighbors can't visually see the, the business, um, it, we can't require a permit for it. So it's actually really made it a lot more flexible. My grandma cut hair in the back of her house. <laughs> that's, that's a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your grandma you know, knew it. <laughs> you know, she converted the, the three season room into a, there was a hair dryer and a washing station. That's, I yeah. mean, she did that the whole time I yeah. knew her. And cars parked out front. Yeah. You know? yeah. Hey, she it's, cut the mayor's wife's hair. Oh, and, and back so in the, the day, mayor knew it when too. you got your hair done once a week and never washed it otherwise. Yeah. So our current code has prohibited uses that's not one of them. <laughs> but yeah, and actually my mom had an in-home salon as well, so I can relate to that. Um, and I, I take it that she was a, a licensed beautician. I assume she was. <laughs> but even now with some of these things that our zoning code actually prohibits, like a restaurant, if it can be demonstrated that it's no impact, we, it could op potentially operate without a permit, so. Impact, restaurant. Whew. Yeah, I don't know if that would work, but okay. <laughs> it would be like like a home table thing. People come in and then they oh, eat yeah. at your house. Can it tell from a guest? Yeah, do a bar like that too. Why not? Why not? No impact. <laughs> okay, right. so I, well, I was I just—it was interesting to now. me. When my my mother-in-law, who's 101 now, lives with us, when she came to move in with us, we added 10 feet on the back of our house. Now, is that considered? An that that's just an addition. addition. Yeah. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, Kirk, 
mentioned it in my ear. Um, we the local HUD Region Seven has been following our proposed zoning code changes, and they're very interested in what we're doing here in Iowa City. And they've requested to meet with staff, so we're going to be meeting with them next month. Would you suggest to them that they revisit that uh, formula for? affordable housing because <laughs> one of your housing members thinks it's, excuse me, too damn high. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else? No. All right. Uh, motion for adjournment. So moved. Motion by Second. Elliot. Second by Townsend. Discussion? All those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify saying nay. Hearing no nays, we're adjourned.